So we're here at the Hammersley Public Golf Course with Perth Wildcat star Dylan Winlet. Dylan, welcome to the Jewel Podcast. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Excited to do it here. So we've just watched you belting some balls around. You're belting them a long way. How'd you feel you hit them? Uh, I felt good. Yeah, I haven't, haven't swung in a few weeks, so it felt good to get out here. Uh, I think the guys were trying to get out and, and play nine earlier today. We didn't work, so uh, being able to come out here and, and uh, test out the new driving range was fun. So how did you hit them in, from the longest drive perspective? You've just won a $100 voucher here to the Sunny Social. Yeah. Of what, uh, how well did you hit them there? How far? Yeah, I think my best was just over 300 meters, 302, 303, something like that. So I'll take it. Yeah. 330 yards for, for, for yeah, you? Yeah, about and 330 for me. Yeah. I always got to do the uh, conversion in my head. It's about 10% longer, so yeah. Right. And you play a game called 21, which is effectively blackjack, where you're hitting it at fake cards, which don't really yeah. exist. They're virtual cards. And you managed to go blackjack, blackjack. Like, yeah. you, you, you're pretty handy, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been playing this game for a long time, so um, I don't get to practice this much, but I still have pretty natural swing that I've kind of developed over uh, quite a bit of time. So, yeah, I feel pretty confident out there. Well, I'm sure you'll be out here, as we said, at the Hammersley Public Golf Course, which opens again on December 16. Uh, it's been renovated for about 18 months. The course has been closed for about six to eight weeks at the moment as they finish things off. But there is the driving range. It's fully automated, measures distances, and got kids' games as well. So head on out here. I'm pretty sure you'll find someone like Dylan having a hit because he certainly was enjoying it. And you were an amazing golfer. Like, you could have been professional. Uh, yeah, I mean, early on, uh, middle school and, and uh, high school, I played golf or competitively uh, in the summer. I played in tournaments, um, you know, all, all throughout the region where I lived. Um, and I was actually, yeah, I took it. It was between golf and basketball, but um, throughout high school, I kind of pursued golf a little bit harder until the end uh, when I got better at basketball and ended up getting some scholarship offers. But yeah, I pursued golf pretty hard growing up, uh, spent a lot of time practicing, trying to get better. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, my best handicap was plus two, plus three, right around that area. So um, had some good scores, 60, 68, 69 in competitive environments. So, uh, yeah, played a lot of golf before. And you've got a hole-in-one at the Nashville Golf and Athletic on the par 3 14th, which is described as something which can be extremely damaging to the scorecard if you're not focused. It's got overhanging trees. It says the green is blinded by a left-side bunker, the green sloped to the left, and you need local knowledge to have any idea what you're doing there. <laughs> and you've got a hole-in-one. So take yeah. us through that. Yeah. Uh, first time ever playing that course, actually. It's not too far from my house, but it's a, it's a private course. Um, and I actually played with my college coach, college head coach, He's a big golfer, so we get out from time to time in the summer. But, yeah, it was on the back nine. I don't remember exactly what. I think it was 13 or 14. Uh, but, yeah, it was like uh, – it's been a while now. I think it was like 150, 160 yards up a hill. It was actually to an elevated green, so you couldn't see once the ball got on the green. So I knew I hit a good shot, uh, but I didn't actually get to see it go in the hole until we walked up. I uh, saw the divot, you know, about 10, 15 feet past the hole, and I was, didn't see my ball anywhere. So, you know, you start getting a little anxious, start freaking out. Um, and then end, end up looking in the hole, and it was there. First hole in one ever. So I think it was three years ago now. Amazing feeling? Amazing feeling. As, as a uh, competitive golfer and a lifelong golfer, that's obviously uh, you look forward to getting your first hole in one ever. Hopefully there's more. But I'm happy to say I at least got one because – uh, there's a lot of people that play golf for their entire life and, and still haven't gotten one, so it takes a bit of luck. We had Min Woo Lee sitting at one of your games recently, and you, you managed to catch up with him afterwards. Was that a real thrill? Yeah, it was cool to talk to him. Um, I followed him. I watched the PGA Tour a little bit here and there, uh, followed along, and he's had a lot of success. And I actually didn't realize it until I got out here that he was from Perth, so um, seeing him at the game and then getting to talk to him a little bit afterwards and uh, catching up with him was really cool. A wonderful person he is. He's just so relaxed and so yeah. good about how to promote the game and stuff. So let's talk about your basketball. Like I think um, the past few weeks have been really important for you because of the way you've been able to play through the doubles that have been played every single weekend. You've had a lot of injuries over your time. How significant has it been to be able to back up with these games and get through and, and convince you, yourself that your body can handle this now? Yeah, no, it feels good to uh, have, you know, a good stretch of games under my belt in a row here. I'm um, starting to really get in a good form. Um, you know, body's been feeling good. Um, and, you know, we've been playing well as of late. So, um, yeah, I'm excited for this team and kind of the track that we're on. We've created some good momentum for ourselves. Um, Would have been nice to get both uh, this past weekend. But, you know, we've had a good last stretch of games. So uh, I'm excited with 
where we're at and where we're going. So if you look back 12 months when you're in, in the States, you played uh, November 11, 12 and 15, and then you needed three weeks off. You played December 16 and 17, then it needed two weeks off. So it's the back-to-back -back element of it, which was destroying you. How hard is it when you have that sort of scenario where you're coming into games going, I wonder if I've just got generic soreness or if I've actually got real soreness that I need to rest? Because it is a mental game with your body. Yeah, I mean, I don't remember exactly what those injuries were but a lot of times it's just like I've had a lot of brutal sprained ankles um, just kind of knick-knack injuries Achilles soreness uh, stuff that kind of flares up knees um, but uh, recently you know it's been just turning ankles here and there stepping on people's feet it's a lot of stuff you can't really control um, but yeah this is part of the game you know uh, I think uh, our roster as a whole has kind of had to deal with that this year uh, we've had a lot of guys in and out of the lineup and it's a part of the game, unfortunately, injuries, but um, always happy to, to be to be healthy and be out there. So, What was the biggest injury you had in the NBA? Uh, I developed a stress fracture in my tibia um, going through pre-draft process, and then after I got drafted, um, ended up having to get surgery. Uh, they put a uh, metal rod in my left tibia, um, and that caused a lot of distress and um, inflammation and stuff. So that, that was a pretty tough surgery to deal with. Um, injury itself was just kind of over time, but uh, the surgery having to deal with it was tough. Especially when you're just getting into the system yeah, and you're yeah. like, I, I made it. No, I yeah. haven't actually made it because I can't get the body right. Yeah, it's tough, especially when you've never dealt with any type of orthopedic procedures or any type of major injuries. Um, yeah, it was tough mentally and obviously physically. How do you reflect on your time in the NBA now? Uh, yeah, I'm grateful for my time. Uh, I learned a lot. And um, like you said, I've obviously battled some injuries and had a lot of ups and downs, uh, but a lot of good times, a lot of bad times, um, you know, dealing with a lot of stuff emotionally. But uh, like I said, I'm just grateful for it all. Uh, it's a good journey and hopefully uh, propel me through the rest of my career. Was it what you expected it to be when you were entering it? Like, here's so many different stories about everyone's different experiences. What was it like for you? Man, I just, I kind of went into it with, um, without much thought and just kind of enjoyed everything, took in everything as it came. Um, I think the best part about it is just the people you meet and the relationships you form along the way. There's a lot of really cool people uh, you meet going through that and a lot of good friendships that last a lifetime. Um, so that's definitely the, the biggest thing I took away from it all. You got to play with arguably the greatest of all time, in the top handful of the greatest of all time in LeBron. Yeah. Like, what was, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, I remember when I first got the call, um, I was playing for the the uh, Westchester Knicks, the, the Knicks G League team at the time, and then I got the call up from Palinka, and they ended up signing me, and I remember I was in Delaware at the time, and I flew across the country out to L.A., and then the next day uh, I was showing up at Crypto.com Arena for a game and entering the locker room with LeBron James, Anthony Davis, D'Angelo Russell, you know, uh, big-time superstars. It was just it was very surreal uh, looking back just in the moment um, going into that locker room and just uh, a lot of emotions in such a big – uh, in such a short amount of time, a lot changed. Uh, but, yeah, like you said, greatest of all time. And it's who I looked up to in my en entire career. So to be able to play in the NBA is obviously a dream. But to be able to play alongside such a such a great and somebody you looked up to your whole life is it was just surreal. What stands out when you – not just in a game, but when you're seeing him every day doing stuff for hours and hours on him, what makes him different to others? His preparation, his dedication. Um, I think it's very easy for somebody who's – pretty much broken every record in their 20th season um, doesn't have much more to achieve you know he's um, etched his stone in uh, greatest of all time and just his his preparation and you know he was always the first one showing up to the gym he gets a lot of work done on his body um, always making sure he's hydrated just little things that add up to be able to play for that long at such a high level um, you know showing up on game days for a seven o'clock game showing up to the arena at 2 two thirty. Um, just to start his activation and start his routine. Um, like I said, it's just a lot of people wouldn't do that because, um, like I said, he doesn't really have much else to prove at this point. That must be inspirational to see when, you, when you're trying yeah. to make your way and everyone else is trying to be even just a, sure. a scary of him and he's doing that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, it's impressive. Like I say, he doesn't have to do it and uh, just his willingness to still do the little things. Uh, to try and be great is it's inspiring for sure for somebody coming up um, wanting to work hard and following those footsteps just to be able to see it firsthand uh, and witness um, 
is, is pretty special. And when you're in the position that you were in, which was you start at Cleveland and then you end up at New York in October 2023, Lakers in January 2024, Atlanta in March 2024. So you're just moving around yeah. the country, zero security. No. Like, what's it like when you're trying to settle, find somewhere to live, wondering where your job's going to be, you've got a wife as well? Like, yeah. That can't be easy. No, it's not easy. Um, and my wife helps me greatly through all of it, you know, move in, coordinate and all that stuff. Because um, for me, you know, when I get the call, I pretty much move the next day, fly out the next day to the city and just live on wearing team gear for a week or so until I get all my stuff out there, um, figure out how to get your car out. And and uh, logistically, it could be a nightmare. But, you know, that's you. That's when you really start to see uh, the business side of the NBA. You know, at the end of the day, it's a business and, you know, players are moving parts as part of a roster and contracts and it's all part of the business in the NBA. So, um, you know, when you get in those situations where you, you're on two or three, four teams in a season is when you really start to see it. So is playing actually the easiest part of when you look at the mental element of it, trying to yeah. work, trying to know whether you're good enough and what your role will be in each team and the playing of back-to-back -back games and constantly being on planes and trying to recover. Is the game actually, in a, in a way, the easiest part of the week? Yeah, I mean, in a way, yeah. I mean, the game is what you've been practicing and doing your whole life, and it's what you enjoy doing. Uh, so when you're out on the court, you know, obviously you're still playing against the best players of the world, and it's still very challenging. But in a way, um, you know, that's the easiest part. There's a lot of moving parts and, you know, a lot of politics that go along with the business of the NBA. And um, like you said, there's a lot of travel and logistics and, you know, a lot of people talking, um, you know, it's refreshing to just be able to go out there and play. I thought it was interesting when you arrived, JR said, said that the biggest challenge for you would be working out that they need you to be a star as opposed to being a role player in the NBA. And there's a big difference because you're a star for one when you're coming through, you yeah. get drafted, then you told them, no, go and do this. And now we need a job here to be back being a star. How long does it take you to, to get your head around um, having to be the impact player again rather than doing something to allow a LeBron sort of player to, to go and do his thing? Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest parts about playing professionally is moving to different teams, playing with different players, um, having to adapt to different roles. Um, you have to change the way you play as a player. Obviously, I played differently the way I did when I was in college being a star player versus coming into the NBA, being, you know, fourth, fifth guy off the bench, uh, being a role player and then coming back over here and being, you know, one of the top players having to, uh, you know, try to lead the team again, just kind of have to shift that that um, that focus and kind of how you prepare to the game and your workouts shift a little bit differently. You know, in the NBA when I'm, I'm just working on a lot of spot shots and, and spacing and trying to help, um, you know, make it easier for the star players who are working in the pick and roll. Um, and now, you know, when you get over here, you have the ball in your hands a little bit more. So um, it's just – it's just all part of the game, playing professionally, adapting to different roles. We hear all the time that it's about opportunity and, and being in the right place at the right time a lot of the time to get back into the NBA. Where do you see, where do you see your chances of, of slotting back into the system if you get a chance? Yeah, I mean, that, that was never really my focus, even in college. Um, I just kind of tried to develop myself as a player and see how good I can be. Um, and that drove me to work hard and continue to, to, to try and be the best player I could be. And the NBA was kind of a byproduct of that. And I think I'll take the same mindset being out here is, you know, just try to continue to develop into the best player I can be, try to help my team win games, win championships. And if the NBA is a byproduct of that, then that's, you know, I don't think there's any point into looking to try and play a certain way to get back in the NBA. It's just try to do the best you can for the team you're on. And um, if scouts see value in you as a player, then, you know, then that's the next step. When you arrived, we were told you're going to be this rebounding star and a high-scoring player and stuff. And I don't reckon anyone thought you'd be the bloke locking down on James Bateman and saying you're not going to have an impact today. And you, yeah. you, you were prepared to sacrifice your own game that night and ended up that you got the rewards at the other end as well. What was, the, was How did you find that experience? What were the big lessons from it? Yeah, like I said, that's that's another role that I've kind of developed into this season is, you know, having to guard um, some, some uh, high-scoring guards and just um, – different types of players that I haven't had to guard in the past. Um, just kind of stepping up to that challenge. JR's um, put me on some some uh, really talented players the last few weeks. And like I said, that's just that ever-changing role within a team that you kind of have to adapt to. And, um, you know, I enjoy the challenge. You know, it's an honor when a coach um, picks you to, to guard the other team's best player, whoever's the hottest in that time. Um, so, yeah, just trying to, like I said, just trying to do what I can as a player to, to help the team win. If that 
means shooting 10 threes tonight, it means shooting 10 threes, or if it means guarding the best player and only getting a few shots, you know, maybe that's the rule for that game. You're so long and and lean and powerful at the same time. Like you were so disciplined with that Bateman game. You just said you're not going to score yeah. no matter what. How do you mix and match between what you want to do on certain players and utilize your length versus some guys who you might want to lock down on and just get right in their face and just give them no space at all? Yeah, I mean, it just kind of depends on the game plan, depends how the team plays. Um, Bateman, you know, he obviously had a career night against us the game before, and he hit a lot of threes. They were running off him off a lot of screens, so it was just kind of being disciplined, chasing, making sure to go over screens, not getting caught going under, uh, stay down on pump fakes, and just um, really running him off the line and getting him in the paint and kind of using my length to, to, to disrupt him and, and make him make tough shots. So. And on the other end of the, the, the spectrum, you got Bryce Cotton, who's doing remarkable things. Did you, did you know anything about Bryce before you arrived? Not a whole lot. I, um, I knew his name, uh, but never really got a chance to watch him play. Um, I knew he'd been MVP over here in this league several times, but like I said, never got a chance to watch him play. Just uh, heard some things. So what stands out to you now that you've seen him doing his thing? Obviously, he's an extreme talent on offense. Um, I've played with a lot of great players that uh, know how to score the ball and can shoot from wherever, and they're shifty and um, you know make it really tough on a defender. But you know, seeing him these last three games score the ball he way, the way he has, and honestly, in practice, some days he's doing the same exact things against us. Um, you know, it's pretty remarkable to see the consistency and see him, you know, be up, having 59, 49, 40, three games in a row is extremely hard, uh, let alone doing it once, doing it three games in a row. Uh, you know, when teams are game planning against you, trying to take the ball out of your hands, still finding a way to score. And, you know, he's hitting a lot of tough shots in a lot of different type of ways. So, um, you know, he's just the ultimate scorer. So you played 101 games in the NBA, and only one in only one of those did one of your teammates score 40. And you've played 14 games in the NBA, and Bryce has wow. done it three times. It's um, it's crazy to think. Like yeah. we, we can sometimes get blasé, I reckon, and go, "Oh, Bryce is doing his thing." But no, Jokic yeah. and Giannis are the only two who have scored 40 points or more three times in the NBA this year, and Bryce yeah. is doing it three times in the NBA in, sh in shorter games. Like. He is this marvel, isn't he, who can do things in a short amount of time that what not many people can even think yeah, of. Yeah, I mean, the way he scores in bunches is, is pretty incredible, and it's not something to take for granted for sure. Um, like I said, you know, scoring 50 almost three times, three games in a row is extremely tough, let alone um, when teams are game planning for you and they know you can do it. So, that, you know, they're doing everything they can to try and help you not to try and keep you from scoring. You're still able to – and he's doing it so efficient too. Um, in so many different ways, which is that's that's the challenge of gardening him so many different ways. Interesting time of year coming up for you with uh, your wife's over here, correct? Yep. Yeah. So obviously you're going to go on the road forever now. Like yeah. It's a long time. You'll come back and forth in between. But what? How's your wife settling into into WA and and, and the challenge now that you, where you'll be away a lot? Yeah. That. I mean, lo we are going to be away. She's enjoying it here. Um, she's. Um, we're living in Scarborough. It's a really nice area, and um, she's enjoying her time here. Uh, to throw a wrench into all that, we're going to be on the road for the next, I think, five weeks straight or whatever, but uh, she's actually due to have a baby in 12 days, no. our, our first child. Uh, yeah, so she uh, we have a, a, a date set where she's going to uh, get induced, and hopefully we'll have a baby just before Christmas. So. That must be exciting. Yeah, very exciting, very exciting. So it's coming here yeah. and to have the baby. Like you could have chosen to stay home and yeah. go, no, no, we'll do it, we'll do it all there. But it's a bold move to, to bring a pregnant wife all over yeah. the other side of the world. How have you handled the, the, that sort of change? Uh, you know, for me, it's easy. Obviously, it doesn't really matter to me a whole lot. It's, you know, speaks testament to her and um, – you know, she's just always super flexible and always willing to go with the flow. And um, she's just very easy going. It makes it easy for me, um, you know, when she's willing to, to follow me around and, and deliver a baby in Australia. So, so you got she cans, doesn't complain much. you got Cairns on December 14, Illawarra on December 22, mm -hmm. Christmas December 25, clearly, then Adelaide December 28. Where are you slotting it in? Uh, I think the plan is to... Fly home straight after the Illawarra game, and I'll probably head to the hospital. And then uh, I think she'll go in that night, and hopefully 
deliver the baby the next day. So Christmas Eve, yeah. Christmas Eve baby. Uh, that would 20, work. Hopefully 23rd, 23rd could, be, yeah. could be 24th. But yeah, we're, we're trying to fit it around the schedule. Um, you know, management has been great and said, you know, don't worry about it. If you have to miss a game, it's, you know, completely understand. But uh, competitor and me, you know, we, we only have 30 games versus, you know, 82 in the NBA. It might be okay to miss a couple. Uh, but, you know, this point in the season, um, you know, obviously I want to be there for the birth and I'll make sure I am. But if there's a way we can uh, avoid me missing a game, that's that's what we're trying to do. And will your parents fly over or her parents fly over? Her, uh, her parents will, will fly over, I think, Christmas Day, actually. So just after the baby's born and uh, stay here for a couple weeks. So that'll be super helpful for her, obviously, uh, me being away for much of the uh, end of December and then early January. It must be like the most remarkable time of your life, really. Yeah. You're, about to have, you're about to become a father yep. in a different country. It's, you wouldn't have ever considered this would be the case? No, never in a million years would I have guessed I'd be having my first child in uh, Perth, Australia, and a country I've never been before until three months ago. Um, so, yeah, it's crazy where life takes you. And your little one will have a dual passport as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, uh, yeah, we... We thought they would have full dual citizenship, but I guess that's not how it works over here. You got to live here for at least a year. So, um, but yeah, regardless, it'll be special. And Christian Doolittle had a bub during the off season. His wife went home though. Yeah, during, during yep. the season to make sure it was all okay. So you've got a you've got a busy time in your yep. life coming up. Very well, busy. Well, a lot good going on. Good luck with it. Hopefully, you get to Illawarra. Yeah. To play the game. You get home <laughs> without any delayed flights, exactly. and, and your wife has. And, and yourself both have an amazing experience and um, yep. become parents just before Christmas. It will be uh, an extraordinary few days. I really appreciate your time. You've been yep. a joy to watch so far. And thanks for joining us on Drupal Podcast. Appreciate you having me. Thank you.